prodigious children, together with that of the line of succession from famous teacher to famous student. George Howard cuts him as one of our most famous child prodigies. Though he was born in Sydney, his parents brought him to Dunedin as an infant. He started piano at four and performed throughout New Zealand as a child prodigy. That he was a precocious pianist is clear from the score of his first published piece, La Pluie de Printemps, published by Beggs and also incidentally by us in Living Echoes. The cover shows him in velvet knickerbockers and waistcoat, proudly holding up a, vil a volume of Mozart sonatas, having evidently just given a recital of them. There under is his name, George Trutzim, aged 10 years, and above is the name of his new piece, Spring Rain. It consists of a simple aria-like melody and a set of exquisitely difficult variations, proudly displaying his own wonderful prowess at arpeggiations and complex harmonic trills, obviously containing every last bit of his pianistic virtuosity. He claimed that he never had any tuition in composition, so he was a self-taught man. In the late 80s, however, he was asked to teach Alfred Hill. Not a success, alas. Hill writing that he found Klutzim a genius of a kind, but not a good harmony teacher. <laughs> so Hill went to Leipzig for three years of much more formal study, and in 1889, Klutzim went to London. He had a quite extraordinary career there as a pianist and accompanist, a composer for piano, chamber, and orchestral music and opera, as songwriter and librettist, writing the musical Lilac Time, for instance, for which he reworked much music by Schubert, and also became a composer for silent movies and then talkies. In addition, he wrote not only much music criticism, but also a biography of Schubert. He was known at first for his serious art music and at least until 1920 was listed amongst the most advanced and interesting of the younger generation of serious composers working in England. A close student of Strauss and Debussy, whose work reveals great mastery of orchestral possibilities and many clever touches of instrumental humour. He was fascinated by the music of Scriabin and Debussy, exploring the former's advanced harmonies, on which he wrote an article for the journal Musical Times in 1913, followed by articles on the latter's whole tone scales and the state of contemporary composition. Here are three pieces displaying different aspects of his style. First, Carillon, Peel of Bells, written in 1904. showing his sense of fun, the mill stream of 1918. <laughs> Thank you. 
Saxon's Berceuse of 1919, at the height of what has been described as his characteristic modern, modernist style. turned increasingly to lighter music. He said the financial rewards were much greater. And he became interested in imitation of the Negro music of the American South. He's undoubtedly most famous for Oh My Curly-Headed Baby. As a footnote to this brief discussion of Clutsam's importance, it should be noted that he also had a mad genius of a brother, one F. Clutsam, who invented circular piano. <laughs> Alfred Hill said it was a beautiful object to look at, designed to make allowances for the circular sweep that hands and arms naturally have, but too revolutionary to succeed. It did, however, appear on European concert platforms. Would that we had this piano now. <laughs> Clutsam's erstwhile student, Alfred Hill, is one of the better known of our early composers. His father brought the family to Wellington, where he opened a hat shop on Lambton Quay. Hill's Hats. The company's still in existence. You've all had a Hill's Hat. Young Alfred was encouraged to make as much music as, par as his parents did, first on a drum, to which bills had been attached, then on the cornet. His cornet teacher was a sailor who gave him sporadic lessons, the timing dependent upon when his ship was in port. <laughs> By eight, violin and viola lessons began. He and his four older brothers frequently toured around New Zealand with their father as a troupe of entertainers. <laughs> Eventually, after his lessons with George Clutsam were deemed insufficient, Alfred and his brother Jack were sent to Leipzig for three years for violin and composition lessons. These were his formative years. It is frequently said that his style did not develop greatly thereafter. But, now many more of the thousands of pieces he wrote have been found, and some recorded, and it can be seen this judgment was too hasty. His style had elements not only of Reinecke, but also of Vaughan Williams and Delius and Scriabin and possibly moments of Elgarian grandeur as well. He is a master of lyrical expressiveness, the writing sometimes post-impressionist, venturing to occasional chromatic or dramatic explorations. Small wonder that he was sometimes called the father of New Zealand composition. The father of New Zealand composition. Our third one so far. <laughs> we'll hear the first two lines, I'm sorry, of his piano sonata in A with its lyrical questing mood.
from a collection of eight piano pieces called Loose Leaves, a piece showing quite a different aspect to his music, noisy, almost grating and dynamic, a distinctly New Zealand work, the Tanifa. <laughs> There is another thread to our musical life, starting in the 1890s, with the importation of examiners to grade our children in music exams. An examination tour could take some months in those days, and some examiners returned frequently, allowing enough time here for them to be inspired to write music about our life and our scenery, and giving sufficient efforts and time for us to treat them as New Zealand composers. Thomas Haig was one of the long line of organists who was sent here, Haig himself touring at least 20 times over the first third of our last century. With a doctorate in music, he was known as one of the leading organist, or organ recitalists of his day, with many large-scale organ and orchestral and piano works. He was also known to be fascinated by life in the Antipodes, taking a job later in life in Sydney, very close to his New Zealand haunts. Of considerable interest to us, though, is a set of piano pieces written during his New Zealand years, Maori land sketches for the piano. All are competent, but the fifth, Rotorua, Boiling Mud Pools, is inspired. Listen for the plopping of the mud puddles as his footsteps take him wandering through the strange, otherworldly landscape. <laughs> was Alfred Mistowski. He also wrote music about his relationship to this land and was published in Dunedin by the Triad magazine. community, we move back to the thread of our bad boys and lawbreakers. Robert Adam Horn, born in Tasmania in 1869, ran away from home three days before his 18th birthday. The reason? To marry his 16-year-old child bride, Lydia, who was a variety artiste with Hudson's surprise company. Both lied about their age. 
but he had no visible means of support and Lydia lost hers when she ran away. Within a very short time, they were fighting. Lydia ran off to become a barmaid and then petitioned for divorce, stating that Robert could not support her. Surprise. <laughs> 10 years after his first marriage, Robert remarried, a marriage which was officially sanctioned this time, and he carried his wife, Rosa, off to Christchurch, where he sold music and built pianos, quickly becoming a pillar of the community. As manager of the Christchurch branch of the Bristol Piano Company, he donated considerable sums to worthy musical causes in the city. He also wrote attractive piano music, including a nocturne, a number of the ubiquitous waltzes, one of which won a first prize at the Tasmanian Exhibition of 1991-2, and also a rarity, which I've been unable to source so far, a second tune fully harmonised for Thomas Bracken's God Defend New Zealand for use with the Māori, the original Māori translation of the poem. There is also a beautiful intermezzo, Jour Passé, which you'll find in Living Echoes, unless we don't have time to play this delicate, wistful soupçon. Another bad boy who got into trouble with the police on several occasions for cross-dressing and drunken antics was William Quill. His parents were of Irish stock. His father was proprietor of, the, of Otaki's Railway Hotel. William was sent to school at St Joseph's Convent in Otaki where he was taught the piano. And he must have had opportunity for playing in public for the musical evenings at the hotel were well known. His secondary schooling was in Wellington at St Patrick's College where one of the priests gave him some help with his writing. There in his mid-teens, he wrote the most famous waltz in New Zealand's history the Nikau Waltz, which was immediately published with a full-page Nikau palm on the cover. The local newspaper, Freelance, immediately reported, the Nikau Waltz, composed by D.W. Quill, of which I have just sampled a copy, is a highly meritorious local production. A pretty melody is wrought into a graceful waltz, well marked in its rhythm, and with a swing that makes the feet twitch to twirl off on the light, fantastic toe. <laughs> records. It ran to 16 editions. It was in print until at least 1940, from 1904 to 1940. But its fame stayed alive, and New Zealand's pianists for the next half century enjoyed playing their way through it. Which of you remembers this piece? A show of hands, please. Which of you have played this piece? <laughs> Young Quill's life from then on should have been a charmed one. But early fame must have been bad for him. Four years later, there is an account of his being in trouble with the police for hooliganism. <laughs> it may be that he was led astray by bad company, drank too much, and dressed in, his, dressed in his sister's clothes to amuse his mates in his boarding house. But the tabloid truth, under the heading Queer Quill, <laughs> painted a much wilder picture of the drunken young man tearing up Pirey Street, dressed in short petticoats with a pair of ladies' unmentionables edged with lace <laughs> hanging down over his stockings. He was discharged this first time, but a later occasion saw him under the influence of the brain stealer and fined five pounds after being found making use of one of the statues in Victoria Street <laughs> in front of the Empire Hotel. So he promptly published another charming dance, the Dufferin pol Polka. There's a Dufferin Street in Wellington as well. His unusual life ended very unexpectedly in the influenza epidemic of 1918. Enough of wild young men. Back we go to three more prodigies. Mary Brett seems to have been born to be a musician. Her mother was a singing teacher with a beautiful voice. Her father played not only piano, but also violin and cello. He repaired instruments and played chamber music in their home at night. From the age of five, Mary had two lessons a week on her instruments, one from each parent. 
Her grandmother had a part in her education too. She made a slate with music staves drawn on it, so Mary started composing with her at five as well. By 18, however, marriage called. She had a son and her career was put on hold. Before the war, she did a lot of accompaniment work for Australian radio, but returned to support New Zealand, teaching piano and writing songs, some of which had considerable success internationally. Ali Arun, you may have heard of. The manuscript of a major piano piece found its way to the Auckland Library. This nocturne, in tiny crabbed writing on a really small scrap of paper, turns out to be an amazing piece, turned into four pages instead of one little scrap. It has some of the character of a Chopin nocturne or of a young Liszt. It displays a very sophisticated understanding of the pace and also the chromatic material of early 20th century style. another line of musical succession that leads directly to Lilburn. Gordon Alexander Derwent Macbeth lived in Whanganui as a child, one of six children of the chief postmaster. If having great teachers is an indicator, it is no wonder he became such a distinguished pianist and composer. Following tertiary study in Christchurch, he went for five years, five years to Leipzig, the musical destination de rigueur for our talented musicians in this period. And he studied first with Robert Teichmüller, who had been a student of Karl Reinecke, one of the most famous of the Leipzig teachers. From there, he traveled to Stuttgart to work with the famous pianist Max Power. And Max Power was the son of composer Ernst Power, who was a pupil of Wolfgang, the younger son of Mozart, a long musical succession. But back to Gordon Macbeth. When World War I broke out, he sailed to the United States for studies with Herbert Fryer, who taught in the institution which later was to become known as the Juilliard School. Fryer, you will have heard of, a student of both Busoni and Matte. Now the war intervened and Macbeth spent the next years as an entertainer. As soon as the war was over, he took another year's study with Herbert Fryer, who was now a professor at the Royal <coughs> College of Music in London and also studied with others. With such a remarkable study career, it is small wonder that, back home in Whanganui, Macbeth became such an influential and inspiring teacher. Musicians came from all over the country to work with him. He taught the young David Farquhar and Colin Horsley, for instance, and Lilburn will have had contact with him also in his prep school days. However, few compositions have surfaced. Perhaps he was very critical of his own work, or perhaps his papers were destroyed at his death? We know of an operetta, Moonflower. At least one movement of a piano suite survives. There's a beautiful song, All on a Summer's Day, which won the Bledisloe Cup in 1935. That was a big deal. The, 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 this is a British thing. The piano piece, An Idyll, is printed in our Living Echoes volume. And just recently, I've come across this rather lovely Christmas piece, which I hope to print soon in the volume of music of the more advanced New Zealand piano music of the past that I'm currently preparing for publication. Christmas Day. <laughs>
As we approach the 20th century, our musical lines of succession get more interwoven. English-born Ernest Jenner was highly gifted in mathematics as well as being a highly talented pianist, organist and chorister. His father, a shipwright, refused to allow him to study music, however, and he was sent to a teacher training college. It was not till seven years of teaching had gone by, this sounds like a fairy story, that he extricated himself and began studies at the Tobias Matei School, supporting his family by working at night in a theatre orchestra. By chance, he saw an ad in the Times for a lecturer in music at Wellington's Training College. He brought his family out and eventually settled permanently in Christchurch, where he became very prominent, known as an adventurous musician and fine concerto soloist. Douglas Lilburn was one of his students, and in 1936, he gained his piano diploma under Jenner and another of our musical lines of succession. Jenner's compositions, many of them for piano, were distinguished by their fine crafting and intense expressiveness. Some are published by Charles Berg in the famous lyric collection of the 1940s, part of which I hope to republish. Foxglove Bells. <laughs> musical families carrying on through several generations has continued down through the centuries, as we know. The Braithwaite family is no exception. Warwick Braithwaite was a notable opera conductor, and so is his son, Nicholas, today. The elder Braithwaite's career took him from his native Dunedin to London, to Sydney, to Wales. He was the NZSO's principal conductor for two years during the 1950s, but he was also a composer with opera, orchestral and chamber works to his name, and there is a small number of his piano works in the Turnbull Library in manuscript. One of these, Fragment, is, is printed in Living Echoes. Two more, including this Prelude in D, will be published in the planned volume of the more advanced New Zealand pieces.
At the top of the archived box of Charles Andrew Martin's music held in the Alexander Turnbull Library is a little package of sepia-coloured manuscript, much folded and somewhat tattered around the edges. On very careful unfolding, a four-part chorale is revealed with a startling and very sombre message at the bottom, 3618, and sending this from the trenches at the Somme. I hope it reaches you safely. It's pretty much bashed about, but I've been carrying it in my pocket for some time. Much love, Andrew. This find, with its historical import, really shocked me. This is what was composed at the song, and we only have time to play a line or two. precious enclosure and the man himself both made it home safely, thank goodness. Charles Martin, who came from a well-known musical family in Dunedin, became in 1931 Otago's first male student to graduate as a Bachelor of Music and studied thereafter in London. It may have been here that he first became acquainted with post-impressionist music. We're going to give you a little snatch of his prelude in D-flat. <laughs> an interesting and fanciful use of arabesqueries and most unusual rhythmic divisions. Martin went back to New Zealand as a leading figure in the musical world of Otago, known as a highly gifted accompanist and inspiring teacher. However, before he left London, Martin presented his teacher, Harry Fudgen, with the manuscript of this complex five-page piece, Barbaric Dance. It is raw and grandiose, rough and exciting. <laughs> of the New Zealand in New Zealand music. We've looked at various of the elements in common amongst the many composers of our first 84 years of composition in this country. We've observed the use of indigenous plant and place names, the descriptive character of the stories that were told through music. We've understood the hopes and the daring in the stories of those composers whose families made it out to the strange and exciting antipodes to a rough settler's life with all its difficulties, bravado and blackguardry, thence to the excitement of setting up new life in the newest world. We've looked at the musical gifting of knowledge and technique through the decades, the weaving of familial threads and professional instruction, the extraordinary gifts that this life can give, and at the emergence of prodigious brilliance in occasional children of this land. We've journeyed back and forth like the earliest of settlers in search of the richest of education to inform and improve our own life here. And I believe that with the discovery of this interest and fascination of all this music now coming to our notice, we may indeed talk of a perceptible identity 
in our music, emerging to a tower like from the earliest night of our 19th century past into the sunlight of our earliest 20th century. This was indeed an intriguing world that Lilburn was born into. Thank you.